Hi, I'm Thomas the Accidental DM, and today we're going to take a look at this, a folklore bestiary inspired by folk tales and superstitions. Now, this was part of a, a Kickstarter campaign that I supported a little while ago, um, and the electronic version, which we're going to take a look at here, just recently came out. didn't take long for there to be a turnaround, uh, and the physical uh, versions of this are going to be coming a little bit later. Now, it is available for pre-order if other people might be interested, and I'll leave a link down below just in case. Um, this particular version is from the old school of essentials um, version, but there is also a D&D &D 5e. Now, the reason why I picked this particular one up is because I'm more interested in kind of the uh elements than talking about the stories around the fairy tales, the stories around then uh, the creatures from those old myths and getting those to use as kind of ideas. I don't really play old school essentials, um, but this was the one that I kind of picked up. So let's take a look to kind of see what they have inside. And so uh, kind of as we go down, uh, very nice kind of art that kind of goes with this. Another thing that kind of really kind of uh, drove me to it to kind of be interested in. And one of the nice things, I wasn't necessarily expecting it, but kind of one of the nice things is it does give you then uh, these characters that you can kind of, I guess you want to do a little bit of, uh, well, let's just... Uh, pit some people against some of these uh, fairy tales. Uh, we have the people from our art uh, giving us some stats on how to do that. Now, again, this is old school essential version, but I imagine they probably do the very same thing in the 5e version as well. So we have... Apodemos, the ins inscrutable Algate of Kilmera, and Wistello. So we have a thief, a paladin, and a gnome, kind of giving you the stats that are there. Beautiful artwork. I do uh, find that inspiring and kind of helpful uh, with uh, potential adventures idea. Interesting, the uh, kind of the, the rabbit on the paladin. I um, wonder if that's a um, kind of a reference to a little Monty Python. But anyway, uh, let's just jump in. We have then, listen, alphabetical order. Uh, we have then the uh, the various uh, creatures, beasts that are going to be a part of this, um, as well as another appreciative thing for if you are going to be using this for either 5e or old school essentials, uh, kind of giving you hit dice, I imagine with the 5e it'll be kind of the... Uh, uh, challenge rating. Uh, but in alphabetical order, we have a lot of different things to kind of look at, starting from the Anghead all the way to Wolf Walkers of Osrage. Uh, with everything in between, uh, I see a Krat, I see uh, uh, Gomberu, uh, a Knoll, a Daihu. A lot of these I'm just not too familiar with, so I think it'll be a little bit of fun to kind of see what those are about. Uh, we have then as well, we get to see who are the people involved. We have the art by uh, Letty Wilson, uh, writing by a whole slew of people, uh, which I'll, uh, get, you've got time to kind of take a look at some of the people that are listed there. And then uh, even though this is the old school essentials version, it does let you know who did the, uh, the 5e version of it as well. Uh, so kind of taking a look at the first one, uh, we'll kind of jump around a little bit. Uh, it does let us know that this uh, creature does come from the Basque country. Uh, and good. Oh, good. It does give us a kind of a pronunciation guide here. So Bachayaun. Uh, and we're told they lived here long before we came from them. We stole the secrets of livestock and farming. These rustic giants who roam mountains and forests and live in beautiful secret caves are some kind of, sometimes called the wild lords because they know the secrets of nature. Here are some true stories about them. Okay, and so we have several stories, kind of this, the first one, uh, looks a little bit long, so let's just jump to the second one here real quick. One day another uh, shepherd named Pierre saw a bachayun, um running down the mountains, overtaking him to chase two wolves away before they could attack his sheep. Uh, then we have the same adventure happened to the three Aketo brothers, who when they saw the Bachayun um, came in, the youngest jumped under his bed, the middle brother screamed in fright, the oldest brandished an axe, the Bachayun struck, uh, shrugged at his threat, grabbed the man, and cracked his head between his teeth like a nut. So Sounds like this is going to be a kind of formidable uh, opponent in a lot of ways. Um, and then we have some uh, more stories. Um, then uh, there is then kind of the, the female version of this as well, the Bansaderi, or the Basajun females. They're extremely rare, uh, less than one female per 10 males, and their numbers keep declining for reasons unknown. They rarely leave the vicinity of their dens, spending most of their time in the sun brushing their hair while singing songs that attract nearby animals. Uh, they give us some names as well. Um, and then a little bit more of a description, a uh, 10 foot tall humanoid, a silky mass of beard and hair covers his long body uh, and legs emerging from it where a face could be, one can see a long nose, two black glittering eyes, a wide mouth and a missing chin. Um, okay. Uh, and then we do have then, because this is for uh, gaming purposes, does have the sp stats. Specifically, this one is set up, as I said, for old school essentials. Um, 
And then we have a little bit about their, their special abilities. And again, this is, even though it's set up for this, you know, it's the ideas kind of behind it. So we have the, it's kiss, which is a target is hit by both slaps in the same round. Uh, the creature grabs and bites their face for two D8s. Okay, so there's this idea of somehow being able to cause even more uh, damage with, through this through this thing called the kiss. Um, it is mentioned is called the wild lord. Again, um, understands the whispers of the wind and the trees, the gurgle of streams, as well as the languages of small animals. He's always warned about avalanches, storms, or any other natural phenomenon. A Basajun is aware at all times of what is happening in his domain, who is entering or leaving it. Uh, so it's letting us know that this is a creature that it's going to be hard to kind of get a drop on. Uh, and again, we get a lot more of these little bits about them. So for riddles that a secret known to few, uh, Basajuns are very fond of games. They're also uh, bad at them. So the best thing, uh, way to calm an angry Bajun is to ask him a riddle or a charade uh, if he misses a, a save versus spell. Again, that's just some mechanics that are neither here nor there for us. He stops whatever he's doing and devotes all things energy to the riddle, plunging into an abyss of contentment and confusion. So it's a way of distracting um, uh, the Basajun uh, and kind of moving them away from whatever is they're doing. I think that's a, that's a kind of an interesting mechanic that might uh, have some uh, some use and value uh, in games as well. All right, uh, let's just kind of skip through. Okay, so that's kind of uh, the rest of that we do have. It looks like uh, we have another one here, but let's just kind of skip through and uh, stop randomly at another one. Okay, and so kind of just the next one to kind of take a look at then. Uh, again, another one from uh, the Basque country. Um, might be interesting to kind of go through the, the list and see what's all there. Because uh, just these two randoms on the first ones have uh, both been from, from Spain. Um, and it is pronounced as Batshi. Again, we get a nice little pronunciation guide for us, which is very good. Uh, so Bad Batshi, uh, a master blacksmith living a solitary life in the hills. Okay, so it is said that many years ago there lived in the Basque country not far from the Merry Mushroom Mushman headquarters. If you those over from Babeo, a blacksmith named Patakshi Aramenteria. He was known to lead a life full of vice and sins, but Patakshi was the best blacksmith in the region. The king's men were ordered to leave him alone. Excellent. Um, so, uh, his dreadful reputation even reached hell, where demons have been fighting over who could get his soul. The winner showed up one day at Patakshi's house to take with him to hell. The blacksmith first uh, politely invited the demon to sit at the table and have lunch to build strength before their long journey. The demon gl uh, gladly obliged, especially since Patakshi was also known as a good cook. But then finished eating and tried to get up, he discovered that Patakshi had smeared his seat with sticky resin. The demon spent the next seven years there, tortured and humiliated by the blacksmith in winning ways every day. So it sounds like uh, this is quite a cunning uh, individual as well. So not only uh, kind of skilled in their craft, in their particular craft here of uh, being a blacksmith, uh, but the ability to uh, um, uh, kind of use their environment and... Uh, uh, in ways that would be able to kind of trick others. And especially when you're dealing with demons who, as we know, kind of um, have that ability themselves to kind of be very uh, strict legally in terms of the sense of the way, way they like to use words and the ways that they kind of understand things. And so this is definitely kind of a, a cunning individual. Uh, we're told Patakshi finally died of old age. Death came from him and took him straight to hell. But the demons were now afraid and wanted nothing more to do with him. So they closed the gates of hell just before he arrived. He was finally brought to heaven, but St. Peter flatly refused to let him in. Out of sheer weariness, death brought Patakshi back to his house and forgot about him. If one day in the hills you hear a hammer striking an animal, Beware of the blacksmith and do not ever accept an invitation from bad Patakshi. Whew, interesting. Okay, um, so we do know have his, his magic tree. Uh, has a fig tree in his garden which bears uh, mouth-watering, gorgeous-looking fruit all year round. The tree also produces a magical resin, uh, which seems like we got a universal glue. Uh, the tree itself is a trap. Um, and let's see, the first time you eat a fig, a roll a 1d6. Um, so what are some of the things that it might do? Okay, yum. Um, uh, yum is the best fruit ever. Yum lose constitution and savers. Okay, so it could be something that um, every once in a while it causes then uh, some sort of a poison of some type. Uh, Bad Patashi's treasure and cash under the main furnace of his underground workshop uh, lies Patashi's hoard along with his masterpiece, the sentient sword Edigaxo. Ooh. Ooh, 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 Adagaxo, sentient sword. Let's take a look at that. Triple curved blade made of alien metal, finely engraved with scenes of storms on the mountains, handles of titan bone. Inlaid with a gold silver thread, it has a lightning-shaped iridium guard and a pommel made from a piece of meteorite. Hmm. 
I, you know, I just, I'm just kind of thinking in terms of, I, uh, uh, I think because of this book, it's kind of set up for that, uh, kind of those fantasy tropes, but this might be uh, something that could be brought into really, I think kind of a sci-fi setting as well, perhaps, uh, folklore and kind of different, uh, uh, different, uh, space faring people. But yeah, this, uh, this store that comes from the other world. I mean, what is, what is it about from the, from the heavens, uh, basically from the stars. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting thing. Um, so we have then with Patakshi's house on top of a small round hill. So his lair then is also going to be something that will be of interest. Uh, we didn't see this before with the last one we looked at, but there's also some things for here on hooks um, that are there. After a TPK, the devil hires the dead characters to investigate the disappearance of three of his demons. Oh, that going then to the, the story about his his life. Okay, excellent. Uh, Bad Pataxi's beloved hammer, Mayula. So uh, this is definitely a creature that is uh, kind of rooted in some of these uh, named weapons. Um, and I think then in a world that's maybe built on kind of honor and uh, possessing maybe of kind of relics, uh, that this might be a character that might have some uh, interesting kind of connections that, or connections that could be used with that as well. Okay, so that was Bad Patakshi. Uh, let's go through, and again, I'm, so far the first two that we've looked at have all been from um, uh, from Spain, uh, but here we'll just stop then at the Skuka uh, from Cambridge, England. Okay, so we have our first non-Spanish, uh, pronounced Shuka, Shuka, sometimes called Uld Shuk. This supernatural hound is said to come straight from hell, but how it comes, it sometimes helps us travelers then. Uh, then we have some stories. This is what my grandmother Alfreda told me. When there's a mist of the fins and no moon, you get lost. Um, I've lived here all my life and I get lost on a clear night. You can still see the cathedral tower even miles off. If you know the way, then you can find your way clear. If you don't, worse luck to you. Hard to tell when a track leads to dry land. Um, so where does um, even experience often a woman like me can get lost? Oh, so I, I'm thinking kind of trickster character is kind of the first thing that kind of pops in my mind. Uh, the point I was lost, already been in the muck up to my knees. The night was getting colder. I thought of my home by nightfall. Instead, I'd be lucky to get back by dawn. Um, if it turned and walked in the midst, but just a little way it turned back and looked at me like it was asking me if I was coming. So I thought, oh, okay. So not necessarily then a trickster spirit, but maybe one that's kind of a little bit more kind of helpful in terms of uh, its kind of activation. So Interesting looking dog, uh, but again, it says it comes from hell. So let's see. Uh, there are many different such creatures, all formed from the ghosts of an earthly hound. Each has its own unique motivations, personality, although they have certain traits in common. All right, so they're not all going to be the same. Uh, they're definitely going to kind of vary from uh, animal to animal because they're coming from something that was already. Uh, bred to be helpers in life, the skuka still has something of this impulse. However, they are also creatures of hell, and the demonic demonic nature cannot be cannot abide when people call on the powers for aid. A human suffers without calling on a higher power for aid may receive unexpected help from a suka. A human who prays the divine while in distress may become the monster's prey. Okay, helpful, but a demonic connection. Hmm. Uh, so we, again, we have some uh, hooks that are given to us. Uh, we're given then some special abilities. Judge of souls. Take a look at that one. The suka can sense to what degree people are evil. It detects alignments and knows the latest sin of crime of anyone it sees is committed. And again, whom? Lie detectors. Good, bad. Interesting. Flaming trail. The suka leaves a trail of burning paw prints behind it. If it tends to help, these prints can be a useful way to navigate. Uh, grab. If the suka hits with a bite attack, it may drag its uh, target up to 20 feet instead of attacking. Uh, Spirit of the Fens. The suka can move at full speed across marshy ground or shallow water at half speed through deep. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's not hindered by a lot of things. And, hmm, you know, in terms of if this is a creature that's kind of meant to kind of be a guide, um, but have that little bit of a twist to it sometimes that... Uh, um, it might not stop then when it comes to a marsh, uh, a marsh or a deep in the woods and kind of maybe leading in the right direction, but kind of also then leading someone behind as well. Uh, again, we have some uh, kind of hooks to look at, etc. cetera. Uh, let's see what else we got. The people of the Holy City. Um, let's see. This one is from Germany. Uh, the Hulenwagen. Hulenwagen. Um in eastern French villages and the hazy streets of German towns and the Netherlands countryside, everyone feared to hear the wheels of the Hollenwagen. 
uh, preying on those on the road or in city streets and this devilish chariot was said to kidnap them and bring them to hell. Hmm. Uh, kind of Banshee-esque, but uh, reminds me a little bit. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember watching Darby O'Gill and the Little People, and uh, when someone died, there was the, the carriage that came and kind of picked them up. Uh, so definitely probably not one that you'd want to have, <laughs> uh, that you'd want to see or hear. So that makes kind of sense why people might be afraid. Um, so let's take a look at some of the stats about it. Again, I'm not interested in the, in the stats per se, but let's take a look at some of its special abilities. The crew, the crew statistics does not change with their appearance as they just extensions of the Holy Vulgan. They're immune to non-magical weapons. Okay, so there's um, creatures that are going to be a part of it. Uh, there's the ghost horse, uh, cannot attack or take damage. Ray horse unjustly sent to hell. Might cooperate with someone able to help them. Hmm. Okay, again, uh, we've got a little bit of a boom, but also a little bit of a bang happening at the same time. Uh, the wagon itself can only be damaged by blessed weapons and holy water. All right. Uh, what does the wagon look like? A peasant's wagon, a war wagon, a royal looking coach, stagecoach, it could be anything. It could be anything. So it can definitely, uh, kind of pop out of anywhere. Who rides it? Demons, goblins, orcs, uh, skeletons, undead peasants, ghosts, berserkers, mummies, Neanderthals, pirates. <laughs> Again, might be anyone there. It seems to be people that, um, wouldn't be considered the best, uh, but yeah. All right, uh, let's take a look just at uh, kind of one more maybe. Uh, I mean, again, there's like lots of these. Um, you know, it's like over 160 pages. So let's just stop on a random one. Uh, oops, <laughs> got to the open game license a little bit. I think this is the last one, the Corpo Seco. Corpo Seco uh, from Brazil, uh, meaning dried corpse. A Corpo Seco is rotting corpse of a person who was evil. Not even the lords of the abyss would welcome their souls. Corpo Seco is incapable of dying and keeps spreading its malevolence wherever it goes. Uh, encounters, crossroads of death. Okay, uh, or the bloody chapel. Okay, so you've got then uh, kind of a... Um, environment kind of set outside or one that's inside. Um, so it kind of go in different places, uh, kind of a crossroads. Um, and I, I don't know, I haven't really looked into this, but I mean, it might have a connection then to kind of the, the devil at the crossroads. Maybe there's some of that that might be there as well. Uh, kind of offering then a, uh, a kind of a deal with someone. Uh, cause there are these, it said these, they are malevolent spirits. Um, so even in the, in the death, they might try to do what they can in order to gain something that they wanted in life that they didn't get. Uh, but let's see, they are undead, so it makes noise as it tells attacks, immune to mind alter, because they're undead, they have regeneration abilities, they have ability to surprise. Uh, interesting that they're able to surprise, yet they have a carrion stench. Uh, parasites, uh, masters of the dead. Uh, so kind of a zombie type of thing. Um, and then it says the worst, whenever the Corpo Seco is about to take an important action, they can affect the characters. The referee may ask, what is the worst thing Corpo Seco could do to you now? Players should give their best effort to answer the question. As long as everyone at the table is comfortable in the situation, I recommend using, okay, uh, safety tools. Then the referee picks the most evil idea. Um, again, I think that goes to that basic idea, that basic, uh, thing that was talked about the earlier, that all about the malevolence that they were. So they're dried corpse riddled with worms and diseases. The rotten eyes shed a scarlet luminescence that betrays the creature's inner malevolence. Um, all right. Um, okay, and we're also giving even more characters then at the end to kind of play with as well. A third level ranger, a third level magic user, and a third level dwarf. Gerfo of Olie, Sarsa Wicca of Mariska, and Kandraka Palindromics. Um, and again, um, this is meant as a bestiary, um, but as I said, this is not a monster manuals. Interesting, right at the back. Shred of the old school, uh, school and via the twisted minds and devious squills of the knock team comes this collection of folk tales featuring monsters who never set foot in a horrific tomb or temple full of evil elements. These monsters uh, come from a source close to all of us that was somehow neglected by the original fantasy game, you know, the Ampersand brand. For some inscrutable reason, the game and its direct descendants have plund plundered the lands of myth and legends, looted the multiverse of science fiction and fantasy, and thoroughly raided the story shores of history, but to keep away from the sleepy village and spooky words of our local fo folk Folklore. This book is bringing about folklore creatures from three continents into the imaginary world they should have never left, along with the stories they are borrowed from. Each monster is presented with pages of material to help you drop it in your campaign, adventures, characters, layers, hooks, rumors, random tables, you name it. 
Uh, and then it gives us a list of what they are. Legendary monsters for legendary games. Okay, so that was uh, kind of taking a look then at a folklore a bestiary uh, that just came out on Kickstarter, at least the electronic version of it. Um, yeah, and it's it's one of those books that, um, uh, like I said, it's not something that I would, I would use per se in, strictly out of a game um, because I don't run Old School Essentials. Um, but for me, it's kind of giving me these other creatures that we don't often get to hear about. Um, as we saw on the back cover, they're ones that kind of uh, Wizards of the Coast just hasn't played with any. And so they're kind of there for us to kind of take a look at and kind of insert into our games as best we see uh, fit. Um, and I'm doing a lot more uh, kind of um, uh, kind of gothic horror type of stuff. Uh, Basin's kind of my current game of choice and so things like these these ideas are something that would uh, very much for me be something that's appealing so if you're interested in taking a look at it again i'll have a uh, link down in the description where you can kind of pre-order uh from the uh, from the kickstarter page uh if you have any questions about this book uh, which i haven't again this is just kind of my first look i don't know everything about it but if you have some questions maybe we, uh, pop it down below and we can take a look and answer the best we can uh if you did like this video please uh, give it a thumbs up um thanks for watching and until next time